So it seems like getting the idea, expanding on that idea, getting organized, and then just going out and taking the leap of faith and just figuring out as you go. Don't get so caught up in the details and trying to figure it all out before you even take the the first leap. Just you have to take the chances, right? Don't get analysis paralysis. Go take, go try it on. Look, look. You can have the, your old life right back. Whatever you were doing right before you had the eight and a half by, by eleven piece of paper, you can go right back to that. You know, six months into it, yeah, you, know, you can go right back to it. Look, your old life will be sitting there waiting for you. Your old friends will be sitting there waiting for you. I promise you, they'll they'll be doing. They're, 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 they've got a little bit better of a video game than you did for six months, and now you're, you're you have some more experience. If you if you win or lose at it, you're you're still doing better than you would have had you not done it. That the, the experience, even when you fail. Just fail forward. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Bolt Wealth Podcast. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm so grateful to be on your show. The work you do is amazing. And uh, I'm just honored as hell to be on, uh, on the show. Yeah, we're fortunate to have you. You've started nine successful businesses, and and what was what were some of these businesses? Can you kind of go through some of them? Yeah, you know, you know, uh, the longest one I've had is CDO Group. It's a construction company that uh, around the country, all fifty states. We do about a hundred million dollars a year. Uh, I started that in a basement of my house, and uh, from there, I've had I've got multiple real estate uh, trusts and companies uh, that are you know my, my kind of my favorite long term play uh, game is really real estate, and then. Uh, I've got a couple of fun ones out there. I've got uh, a waffle company in Europe that is a blast uh, to do. Uh, my wife's f- family started that one and sells waffles all through Europe. And then um, we've got a TV show and then a podcast. Uh, all of them are things that uh, are just kind of, they're, they're kind of hobbies that turned into some fun businesses. And I think that's actually a good kind of topic for our listeners too is, when do you know when something is just a hobby or when do you take that next step and really try to turn it into a business or something that you could do more full time? You know, I mean, one, I think if you find what you're passionate about, look, if you, anytime you find, you know, something you're passionate about, my, my son the other day, uh, changed, changed careers. He wanted to go from uh, construction. He thought he was going to jump into the family business and, and jump into construction. And he changed, he said, no, look, I want to get into cars. Like I love cars. He watches car videos and about cars and things on YouTube all day long. And I said, look, there's the key. If you find what you love, people say it all the time to you, but you're like, I, how am I going to make money? But look, if you find what you love, money will come. Money always comes. People worry about um, thinking about making money first and, I, and, and money is, will come. It, it, I promise you, if you find what you love to do, it always, always, always comes. Now, it doesn't feel like that, right? It doesn't feel like that. You feel like you're you're going, all right, but, but look, I got an electric bill. It's due today, right? I, I, how am I going to yeah. make it today, right? When you're sitting, and, and for me, I think that's what checks most people out of their really great work, right? Is that a lot of us get caught up in fear, anxiety, uh, mental stuff that stops a great entrepreneur from creating what they love. They get caught up in fear. And the biggest problem is that that checks us out, right? As soon as we start into that whole, I got to pay a electric bill today. You know, you start panicking and, you know, just as much as being a drinker or drugs or alcohol, emotional sobriety or mental sobriety checks more entrepreneurs out because every business is about two things. It it literally is just two things. If you have an idea, you expand it and then organize. It's literally those two things. If, If anybody tells you it's much more than that, they don't know. It's literally those two things. Now what's in between those two can be really confusing, right? Because sometimes it's confusing as hell. It's like, all right, I, I, I have an idea. What I want to do a construction company. Great. So I, how do I get my first project, right? How do I, do I need a brochure? Who do I talk to? How do I get to, right? So knowing what you want to do is the start of it, right? Getting the idea. Now you start to expand on things, right? You start to look at, uh, all right, how do I make a sale, right? And once you get a sale, that's, that's, the, that's the best one, right? Once you get a sale, now you, gotta, now you have to go do the work. Now, how do you go? Yeah. Do, how do you hire people? How do you, you know, how do you get a business license? How do you get insurance? All those things will come. That's the organize, right? That's the part where people get checked out and remembering you're going to expand an idea. As soon as you expand it, you're going to, it's going to get hectic. Hectic is what you want. People get all like messed up. Oh, this is crazy. I can't do it. But look, if you're not hectic, you're probably not expanding. 
If you're not expanding, it's probably not worth doing. It's not something you're passionate about. So, so look for the hectic part of it as your opportunity. It always has been and always will be. I love that. And kind of just embracing the chaos and just know that it's, it's really fortunate to be in a position where you have some of that hectic chaos because it means things are happening. Things are going, going the way they should be. I mean, the same thing is going to be happening to us now, right? I mean, I, I, last night I spent a night uh, playing with uh, chat uh, GBT, right? And AI is here. Have you guys played with it yet? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. We actually just wrote a whole hot take script for one of our, like, <laughs> from yeah, right, it. It's, it's, it's pretty a, crazy. It's amazing, right? We know AI is here. Look, that's the that's a pretty clear sign that we're, we've crossed the threshold, right? It's, it's pretty into, we, we spent all night last night trying to trick it and make things up. And it was amazing. Some of the poetry it wrote was like, wow. Uh, some of the jokes it wrote were funny. Some of the ads we had them do, right. It was amazing. So we could say that, Hey, look, that might be the bag phone or the brick phone of, of the, of the technology that's about to come. And a lot of people will check out. A lot of people will be like, oh, my God, it's gonna, AI is going to take my job. I can't take it. I'm going to. And they put their head in the sand and they will do like some taxi drivers did when Uber came around. Right. Uber was like, here, you have this great opportunity to go have your own car and, and operate. Yourself. But no, no, no. I have a shield. I paid money for a shield. I'm not letting go of this. Not realizing it's sunken cost. Get rid of it. Move on. A lot of people put their heels in and they're trying to make, you know, they're still out there trying to run taxis. And you're like, all right, dude, it's time to evolve. Now it's hard because I have something, something I have, I have to let go of what I had to go to where I'm going. And life has always been about where we're going. The great entrepreneurs are about where we're going and being able to be, you know, get out of the fear. Right. And that, that takes a lot of work. I mean, every, every great entrepreneur will go through that. I mean, look, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that every day I get up and I'm not chased by a thousand forms of fear right? Losing the business that we have, but it takes work to find your ability to stay in the, in the fire, in the middle of, of chaos and be able to have vision and slow yourself down and get used to being in a chaotic and chaotic environment and being the one that's calm in the middle of it, right? Being able to stand there while the place is catching on fire and you're being able to watch where the buckets are, where the water is and be able to make sure that you're, you can handle that. Now that's, that takes I, you know, my story around that is that it takes some work, right? That's where we have to really work on us as the entrepreneur. And uh, that's why yeah. I always say to people, work on you. If you take care of you, the business will end up growing and the people that work for you will start growing. And uh, that's that's a big part of being a great entrepreneur. And and how do you not get set in your ways either, especially once you started having su su some success, you're at $10 million a year business how do you go from that 10 million to the 100 million and not get stuck at the 10 million a year look you'll get stuck have grace for yourself look you can't not get stuck you i mean look we get lazy we get tired we get frustrated i mean come on I, I, you get up every day and scott there's there's days i get up and I, I the other day i got up i put my sneakers on i put my shorts on i got all the way over to the gym i sat outside took a phone call and never made it in the gym I was like, no. what? You're, you're at the gym. Like, I can just check myself out. It happened. It was a phone call about this job. And we have a bunch of, we have like, I mean, $10 million worth of work going on in Phoenix right now. And, you know, it, it's kind of like the inmates took over out there for a minute. And um, there was some of the subs had some problems. And I had jumped into some fear. And it just literally, literally that, sh look, even at this level, fear will grab you. And you got to, when you got to have people around you who can help talk you, talk to you about that. And, and don't one, don't feel shame about it. Look, that's what happens. That's part of being a human. It's what's how to survive. I mean, look for millions of years, if you didn't, if you weren't, if you didn't get up scared looking for dinosaurs, you'd be eaten. Right. <laughs> so our, our, our civilizations yeah. here because of that fears, it's a natural part of us. Now, how do we not get checked out or, or have friends or people around us that can, can look at you and go, Hey man, it, it's okay. Right. You're, you're, you'll know, you know, for me, I'm a lot like a thermostat. Right. If I'm at 68, it starts getting a little cold. I better start doing something right at 73. It starts getting a little warm. Right. I got to I got to, you know, it gets, it gets a little hot in the kitchen. Right. Business gets a little re revved up. I might I, I actually find myself sometimes even sabotaging myself. Right. Even slowing it down. You know, I'll say things like, man, things are hectic. Maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should turn off sales. And, and it will, yeah. because we'll, we'll, right, we'll, we'll be in a spot where will fail on something operationally or we're in a project, you know, or maybe we shouldn't take on projects in Phoenix. The subs in Phoenix are tough. 
Maybe we should not work in fear. And the truth is, no, it's just we have to go back and organize well, right? Sometimes fear in the businesses that we run, when we're doing things as humans, we'll get all messed up and we'll start to scare ourselves, right? Well, that thermostat will hit, uh, it's too warm in the kitchen and I will, I'll start to shut things down and I'll sabotage my own success. Now, for me, I have a team of people around me, right? And I've built mm-hmm. these people that I trust. You know, I mean, think about this, Scott, for thousands of years, we were tribal, right? You and I walked with a tribe. We, we, we had an elder. We had people that, that our survival <clears throat> mattered to them. With, without us surviving, they die, right? Without that young blood in, the, in a tribe, you know, they needed us to survive. So their best interest was to teach us well how to, how to hunt and gather and do things. And that knowledge of knowing that the person there that was guiding me had my best interest. Sometimes they probably weren't the best teachers, but they had my best interest. And along comes the Industrial Revolution. Our, our leaders, our families go to work, leaving us oftentimes not well guided. A lot of people are getting their, 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 their feedback loop from Instagram and, and Twitter and likes and not likes and, and video games. And, hey, I got another level. That's a sign of, of success. They don't have that person or people that when they give you advice, the old timer that gave you advice that you could trust right? And some of that's lacking. So finding those people today, there are some amazing business coaches. I mean, amazing, amazing, amazing business coaches out there. And they're like singers, right? They're just like musicians. You got to find the one that rings for you. You might have to go through a few songs to get to a song that you like. That's okay. <laughs> find, find yourself a team of people. Find yourself a good doctor. Find yourself a great business coach. Find yourself a great banker, someone that you can, that you, you know, go over and get advice from. And that, you know, people are oftentimes checked out and they're like, I don't have time to do this. You don't have time not to just know that you don't have to do it today. You've got, you've got, you've got some time to do it. You don't have to do everything overnight, but just start one by one, start looking at, you know, what, where are those, where are those things I need to put together as a team of people. And, and today, I have, and you're trying to build that team out from day one, or do you get some traction going, get some like idea of what you want the company to look like and then start bringing them on? Or when did you start building out that team around you? You're always looking, right? I, I look back over my life and I, I think my first employees were, were friends. There were people <clears throat> they weren't qualified. They were literally people that I, I would, I pulled out of my friends and I propped them up on a stick. I put a lot of tape around them and I propped them up to be business in business with me. And that's how I started, right? And I would, I was a guy running around spinning all the plates. And then you realize, okay, there's probably a smarter way of doing this and finding, but at the time I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to do manage cash flow. I didn't have finances. So you get what you get at the time of the knowledge that you have, right? When you're calling people and you're getting your first sale, I remember my first sale. I was with Einstein Bagels, right? We had started the company and I was, so the first time we started, we had an outsourced construction management company. We weren't a full GC yet. We were, we were just doing construction management for remodels and, and programs. And we're calling the guys from Einstein's. And the first day, the guy's like, I have these, you know, I have like six remodel projects that I don't want to do, but I'll give them to you. And they're in Ohio and I don't feel like going to Ohio. And I'm like, <clears throat> what? I have, I have projects. I didn't even know how much to charge a guy. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, well, it'll be fine. You know, they're going to be six or seven weeks long. I figured, you know, a few weeks ahead, a few weeks behind and I'll, I'll, I'll charge them this much. Right. And how to get paid. All that stuff is part of developing your idea. Now, look, a lot of people will wait and try to do that. Try to figure it all out at first. Stop, go make some sales, go out there and get your yeah. nose bloody. It's okay. And how did you, how did you learn how to do that? Go out there and get the sales or how did you know where to start, where to begin? Well, some of that stuff's hard. I look back and I, I, I worked in like uh, one of those Jordan Belford uh, uh, cold calling rooms when I was a kid. I was younger <laughs> and uh, it was great. Like literally I was on the phone selling, you know, penny stocks for, you know, this, this old man who had me to sit on the phone. He, he would never let me put the phone down. He would say, he was like, kid, don't put the phone down. Just touch it with your finger and get the next call. And you would dial for dollars all day. And, and one day I learned that you could use your voice to make a sale that people weren't going to bite me that I could call someone up and I could even mumble sometimes. In fact, I, I would tell you for most of my career, I, I, I was a mumbler, you know, kind of, kind of mumbled my way through, but it made it more real. I just, I, I yeah. people would, would tell that you weren't so polished. You didn't sound so, you know, fancy and freaky. You were actually real. People kind of like that. 
I, people love that. I, 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 my, my truth is, I think people loved that about me. You were able to be honest about it, like, hey, look, I work for this guy. And, you know, and then I started a little painting company, right? Because the market had crashed in 87 and I was broke. <clears throat> but I had learned you to sell. as a painting I, company? A little painting I, where I painted houses in Florida, right? And yeah. I was working my way through school painting houses. And I, I, I would go around and I'd knock on doors and I would say, hey, I'll pressure clean your roof. Because in Florida, you have these cement uh, shingle roofs, right? They're cement tile roofs. And um, I'll pressure clean your roof for you. I'll clean your roof. And then oftentimes you pressure clean it, they need to be painted. And I'd say, hey, look, for 500 bucks, you buy the paint. Me and my friends will paint your roof. And we would just, we would paint your roof. And we were clean cut about it. We would show up. We were fresh shaved. We'd, we, we had those like little sailor outfits on with the epaulets on. You know, we put the epaulets on. We had a nice clean white shirt and, and, and little shorts. And we looked clean cut. And we looked trustworthy. And, you know, the lady was sitting there going, hey, I want my house painted. And you're going to 500 bucks. And that's a deal. And we thought, we're going to make 500 bucks in a day. Two of us were like, that's 250 a piece, man. That was, when you were yeah. kids, that was, that was 250. You made it. Oh, great. And now, then all of a sudden we got a couple of them a day and then we, we, we learned to paint houses and then we got a commercial project. You never know when it's going to go. You just got to keep trying, right? Get out there and keep trying. And, you know, see, we messed some things up. You know, I messed up a couple of things along the way. And, you know, oftentimes I tell people today is you, the mess ups are the, 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 that's the best part. Right at the time, you don't feel like you're like you feel like a jerk. You're like I messed up someone's painting, or I did something wrong, or I got paint on someone's carpet, or whatever it was. <clears throat> but you learn. Right? Yeah. All that stuff adds to who you are later on in life, and it's well worth the mistakes you make. So it seems like getting the idea, expanding on that idea, getting organized, and then just going out and taking the leap of faith and just figuring out as you go. Don't get so caught up in the details and trying to figure it all out before you even take the, the first leap. Analysis paralysis. Stop. Just go make the sale. You know, um, in 2010, the economy crashed. And again, and I had all these employees and every day I'd come into office and I would say to them, guys, we'll do anything. It just we, we, we were doing hundreds and hundreds of projects. We did 400 projects in 2007, 2008, 2009. And you saw it go... Right. We were just falling. I was falling apart. And every time I'd get a phone call, somebody would stop their construction program and I would lose more. And I was like, oh, my God, I would walk into my, my, my team. I was like, hey, guys, let's just get creative. Come on, stay out of fear. Let's just let's, let's keep fighting for it. Cause, and then one day I get a call from my account and he's like, hey, man, you have no more money. I'm like, what do you mean I have no more money? He's like, you have no more money. You, you, you can't even make payroll next week. You got to tell people that you, I'm like, oh. I have to, it's got to be something we can make payroll. I'm like, no, listen, we can't. You have to, you have to go tell your team. I'm like, you know, it was like two weeks before Christmas. I let 40 people go two weeks before Christmas. And oh, I was God. devastated. I That's going to be worst. 15th floor. I thought to myself, I'm going to jump. I like, literally, I felt so bad. I was like, I could, I, I was so, I was so, you know, uh, wanting to, to not let people down. And um, one of the guys that came to me goes, Hey, listen, we do this thing. We, we get a permit for when we build Dunkin' Donuts, we get a patio permit for them in the city of Chicago we have a license as an expediter for permits. And he goes, why don't we just go get permits for people? When they do these outdoor patios for restaurants, it's kind of a pain in the neck for them, right? Nobody wants to go get it because they have to, you know, do a drawing. You have to go get it signed by the alderman. It has to get down to the city. It's kind of a pain in the neck. He goes, we could charge people 500 bucks to do it. I'm like, no way. So we made it, literally took an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and we drove CDO's patio program. And we, we walked out of the door on Michigan Avenue. Right. And it's, it's still, you know, it's winter time. It's, it's right before Christmas. And we, we, it was right after Christmas. It was right after the holiday. It was like the uh, beginning of the year. And um, we just went door to door to door to door to door to door. And I remember the first, we got, we got two of them on day one. Some, some uh, a company, a place called the gauge uh, gave us our first one. And then their neighbor gave us another one. And the next day we got eight of them. We had eight, we made 4,000 bucks in a day by just doing patio permits for people on an eight and a half by 11. Now we had to go figure out how to go do it. Right. We had done a few of them, but we hadn't done that many of them. And then we just got really good at making a process for it. So we, so as soon as the person would make the sale, <clears throat> you would take pictures of the, of the sidewalk, you'd measure it. You wouldn't leave the place without measure because going back took time. So you want to get, get that to happen. And we get an application. We'd have the application with us. We would make the manager sign it right there. So we knew that going back was going to take time, but we didn't know that until we did a few of them. We had to go back a bunch of times and, organized now all of a sudden we got to the point where we started doing patio permits for people 
and we would do eight, 10 of them a day. We figured out where in the city was perfect to do it. Like we realized that if you're too close, people could walk over city hall, they could do it themselves. But if they were like here, this was like the, like the gold mine, right? This is like, it was too far to send someone downtown It would take them all day. And for 500 bucks, they were, it was well worth having someone else do the work for them. So we kind of found out where that perfect customer was. And then it was like, like, a, like a little business. We started out of nothing. It's literally just some guy said to me, we do this. We have this, we paid 700 bucks for this expediter's license for the city of Chicago. Why don't we try to use that? And then all of a sudden, someone in May of that year, there's a restaurant show. And the lady at the restaurant show, we were doing a, we did a Brugger's Bagels uh, patio permit. And, and the guy said, hey, can you buy my furniture for me? He goes, look, on my plans, it tells me what company I have to use. And I called it. It was a company called Emu. And they, they're distributors out of D- uh, Denver. And I called the lady and I said, hey, we're, this is, my name's Anthony. I'm, I'm doing this patio permit pr- uh, program. I'm, I'm going to buy some patio furniture for your, one of your uh, Brugger's customer. And she goes, hey, I'm going to be at this restaurant show. And I went over there and I sat in her booth with her. And I got to meet this lady who ran Emu America. And she she goes, I like you. She goes, you're, you're here. I'll, I, I need a rep here in Chicago. Will you sell our furniture to your patio people? I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, I'll cut you a deal. All of this furniture that's in his booth, it's worth X. She goes, I'm going to give it to you for nothing. You just have to, you have to figure out how to get out of this. You have to figure out how to get it out of this showroom, right? You, Cause they had to use union people and it, you know, it was expensive going in and out of, the, of uh, the convention hall here. is really expensive. She goes, you figure out how to get it out of here. I'll cut you a deal. That's well worth it for you. I'm like, so she goes, that'll be your showroom. And all of a sudden I had a whole showroom of this cool patio furniture, like her whole booth. She gave me the whole booth for like, I think it cost me like, I don't know, 4,000 bucks or something. And it was, you know, probably worth five or 10 times that much. I, I was worth a lot more than that. So all of a sudden now we're selling patio furniture and we could bring samples to customers. We could say, look here, it's Italian made. It's this great stuff. And people are like, wow, they, that's that they wanted good stuff. You know, people could buy the crappy stuff on the internet and, you know, we were always kind of competing, but when you could see the product, it made a, made a world of difference. And that all happened out of just going down and talking to the woman in her booth, like sitting in her booth with her, Christina was her name. She's this beautiful woman. And her, she, she did, I just sat and talked to her. I was honest. Look, here's who I am and here's what I'm doing. And uh, I, 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 how do you sell this stuff? How do you sell patio furniture? How, how, do you, how do you do it? You taught me how to do it. She goes, look, we have a catalog. And here's how you, you know, here's, it depends on how much they buy. And here's how you price it. And I was like, this is great. You know, and all of a sudden, we're now we're selling patio. And then someone said to us, hey, could you store patio furniture in the wintertime? Because of restaurants. We're like, where do we put this stuff? I'm like, great. So then we figured out how to store patio furniture in the wintertime. And then we'd, we'd store it in the wintertime for them. And then we'd fix it up and put it back out in the summertime. And that became a whole company that I owned that was, you know, did patio permits and then it did the design and it did the, 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 you know, selling furniture, then it's storing the furniture, then refurbishing the furniture and then putting plants out. And all that came out of some kids, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. I would never That's have crazy. known that business going in. I mean, when I was sitting there and he came with that idea about the expeditor's license, we had no idea that we could sell furniture or we could do any of that. We just showed up. Yeah trying every day right and how many of those businesses are you still running and operating today are you still doing the furniture or the storage i sold all that i sold i sold that to somebody they did great you know uh, cdo group uh grew you know really blew up again right where we started we we broke the 65 million dollar mark and then we got companies like mcdonald's and we did a six thousand store program with them and you know all of a sudden it just became so big i couldn't i couldn't go back and forth between those there were there were two really competing companies and it was a good time to cash out. And, um, you know, every once in a while, take some money off the table and put it in your pocket. You know, don't be greedy, right? Learn to cash out when, when, it's, when it's appropriate. It just feels like the right time to take some chips off the table? or I was, I was a little overwhelmed, right? At the time, it was like going back and forth between those two offices all day. I came with you know, some other stuff that just it wasn't able to focus. CDO needed the focus. It was great when yeah. I took that money and I started investing in real estate. And to me, real estate is kind of the peg. You know, when you're when you're climbing a mountain, you keep climbing. You have to put another you know put another uh, peg in the in the mountain so you don't go fall all the way back down. Well, as you get a chance, you you know buy some real estate and some cash producing, self performing real estate. And for me, that that's always been my kind of you know peg 
on the wall, uh, you know, I, I get to a point where, all right, let's take a couple million bucks and go buy some properties. And, and those are income producing properties, which I don't need the money today. I need the money when I retire. Right. So the way I look at those are, they're kind of, they're there. That's a great investment. I make more money there than I do in the stock market. And, um, you know, I, I kind of built a nice little team around the maintenance and the security and all the stuff you need to do to, you know, keep that investment going well. Man. That's you awesome. Know, I love it. That. Love the story. You wouldn't know that, right? Unless you, you would not have known that when you had the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, right? You would never have known that the, it's going to end up at a real estate company at the end of that, right? You would not have known that going in. Just it, you have to take the chances, right? Don't get analysis paralysis. Go take, go try it on. Look, look, you can have the, your old life right back. Whatever you were doing right before you had the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, you can go right back to that you know, six months yeah. into it. Yeah, you go right back to it. Look, your old life will be sitting there waiting for you. Your old friends will be sitting there waiting for you. I promise you they'll they'll be doing they're 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 they've got a little bit better of a video game than you did for six months. And now you're yeah. you you have some more experience. If you if you win or lose at it, you're you're still doing better than you would have had you not done it. That the experience, even when you fail, just fail forward, right? You're gonna fail. You're gonna have some 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 sometimes when you mess something up. Right? Like when I had to let 40 people go a couple of weeks from Christmas. Right. But I, I would, I, I think those people all knew how much I loved them and cared about them and how hard I tried. And, and then the next business, I got as many of them to come back to work for us. And then when CDO sort of grown again, a lot of those people came back again. And uh, you know, I, if you're honorable, even when you fail, people will uh, respect you for, for the, for the, you know, the efforts you make. It's, it's good. Thank you so much, man, for coming on today. And, Thanks. Kind of going through your story. Got me fired up. I got to just keep, yeah, keep thinking through new ideas and keep pushing forward. It's uh, it's exciting to hear your story. Thanks, Scott. I, your show is, uh, it's it's the light. And I'm so grateful that uh, I got to be on your show. I love listening to your show, watch it. It's, it's, a, it's great work and uh, uh, I'm grateful to be on the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And, and last question, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and your story and some of the sure. businesses you're part of. Sure. So um, number one, other people come over and check out our podcast. It's called Future Factory. Uh, you can get us at Future Factory, uh, Future Factory Podcast.com or Future Factory uh, We also, you can find me on, in, on uh, all the major uh, platforms, Anthony Amanategui, A-M-U-N-A-T-E-G-U-I. Or you can email me at Anthony at CDO Group. Anytime you want to, uh, cdogroup.com uh, to catch up with me. So uh, thanks for having me on again. I am so grateful to be on your show.